Okay, so in part two of this week's content, we're going to look at the privatisation and criminalisation of public space in relation to youth culture. So much youth culture happens in public space. Um, and as I think I've pointed out already, this kind of you know, research orientation towards youth culture was criticised very quickly um, by members of the Birmingham School and um, about how this kind of left out a lot of aspects of youth culture, particularly from a gender standpoint. Um, left women kind of supporting acts or left them out at all, overemphasises the spectacular in terms of what's happening in public space, but particularly um, leaves out what's happening at home, which again is a space where a lot of youth culture happens. So um, it's important to point out those kind of criticisms at first, but one of the reasons that youth culture, you know, and a lot of it does happen in public space is that young people want to, you know, escape the surveillance and control of their parents. Um, but what's interesting about this is that public space is now increasingly under the surveillance of a bunch of other other powers that um, young people now have to um, engage with. So uh, youth in this space are kind of going through that socialisation period, you know, from being a child to adult, you know, moving out of the family home, moving out of school, um, spaces where there's kind of fairly obvious, um, you know, uh, people of authority and disciplinary, their parents and, and relatives or teachers and stuff like that. Out in public space, you're kind of, you know, going through that rite of passage um, um, thing where you're kind of testing your boundaries. Um, and this is where young people start to kind of know their limits and um, learn a little bit about the rest of the world and, you know, what they're up for, what they like and, and things like that. What's become clear, though, over the past couple of decades is that public space um, is increasingly privatised and criminalised. And you just think about, um, you know, all the different spaces now where there's shopping, uh, where there, sorry, where there's guards, security guards, that, you know, only a decade or two ago that they wouldn't have been there. This has been particularly well documented in research around shopping malls, which is, you know, a key place where young people hang out. Um, there's, you know, guards there, there's increasingly cops there, there's, um, as was shown, started to be used as a kind of technique in the 90s, if there was a particular part of the mall where young people were, were hanging out, they would start playing classical music there to try and drive them away. And then about 10 years ago, there was the development of this kind of, um, you know, almost dog whistle sound pitch that apparently only you could hear from a certain, you know, age in your teens or something, and it was kind of used to try and regulate young people as well. Um, so, if you think about this kind of more broadly, places like parks, sporting fields, beaches, malls, towns, all these places are under increasing surveillance and have more and more regulations. You can't just kind of go out in public space now and kind of do stuff. Uh, most places are increasingly have very specific things that you can and can't do. In terms of the privatisation aspect, um, this is again particularly the case with places like malls, um, some sporting fields and parks a little bit as well. But here the idea is that, you know, you have to be in these spaces legitimately, to, to be in these spaces legitimately, you have to be spending money. You can't just go and hang out and have fun. This has kind of happened at the same time that many um, kind of youth spaces, particularly government or council supported ones, have shut their doors. Um, and there's less and less things for young people to be able to do um, you know, without having to pay for them. Um, so again, you can see what the obvious implications here in terms of inequality are. Um, it's, it's hard for people with not a lot of money to, you know, uh, do leisure and, and have fun um, legitimately. People without money are increasingly excluded from more and more spaces. In terms of criminalisation, a kind of next step beyond the privatisation, but it's kind of you know, a development of it and part of it as well. Um, it's been increasing regulations about just being on the street. Um, Rob White is a really important Australian sociologist and criminologist in this area and has been was writing about this throughout the 90s and early 2000s. So if you're interested in this to topic for kind of um, the assessment, his work is definitely worth checking out. Even though it seems a little bit dated now, um, it's really important. What he showed that, like, just being on the street, just hanging around talking, was in kind of, you know, increasingly made illegal. There's the new kind of category of loitering, um, and, you know, that even just kind of hanging around and talking can be kind of uh, 
treated as antisocial behaviour. Um, you'll see this too with the um, increasing um, alcohol-free zones that are everywhere, or you know, there's signs up in most parks that are listing a whole bunch of things that you can't do. Um, and Mark Davis's classic book was, is also influential in thinking about this area in terms of the moral panics um, uh, between you know older people denigrating the young, um, particularly about you know crime and, and youth and the kind of you know over-sensationalised understanding of youth gangs that we'll look about look at later in the course. Some of the new laws seem to actually break UN conventions on the human rights of the child. There's a particular example in Queensland um, in the late 90s that um, they made a rule that you know no more than three teenagers could con congregate together in the same place at the same time. Uh, what Davis pointed out, this means that like you know four kids having a game of doubles tennis could be asked to move on. Um, so much of this is kind of linked to moral panics and distortions around crime and particularly around gangs, as I said, we talk later on, and particularly this overlaps with kind of racist attitudes towards non-Anglo young people. Much of the enforcement of these laws is unevenly based. Uh, white kids get a lot of, away with a lot more than anyone that's not white in these spaces. Um, and so, like most laws there and regulations, they are um, enforced unevenly and tend to be concentrated and targeted much more to kind of groups that are already experienced marginalisation and discrimination. In terms of the criminalisation of public space, another really interesting example here is that protesting itself is what's often held up as a kind of almost inalienable central democratic right is increasingly criminalised. And it's an absurd situation when you think about it that you're meant to actually apply to the government if you want to protest against it or if you want to protest against anything really. And increasingly there's designated spaces where you're allowed to to protest and you'll see that like any kind of protest that's organized even if it's like 25 people there'll be a bunch of cops turn up um, as if there's going to be some kind of riot um, so the criminalization of public space and the criminalization of what seems to be like basic democratic behavior has real effects on you know the possibility of groups including young people being able to kind of practice their day-to-day -day life their politics their art their creativity without coming under the microscope of various powerful forces. So what happens in terms of youth cultures? Many youth cultures are kind of almost inherently set up to resist some of these things. And again, speaking back to some of the subcultural aspects that I was talking about earlier on. So as I said, young people in their especially early teenagers are moving through socialization, you know, that secondary kind of realm of socialization, you know, rites of passage, in their initial outings into the public space, and it's here they first come into contact with authorities beyond the home and school. So there's a bunch of learning that goes on there, a bunch of kind of learning about yourself, kind of learning about who's your people and who's not, um, what your interests are and what's not, and how they kind of relate to you know laws, uh, norms, regulations. When it comes to different examples of youth cultures, the concept of bricolage is particularly important for thinking about aspects of it. Bricolage basically involves tinkering with cultural products and icons, borrowing, combining, recombining, discarding, altering, embellishing, inventing, synthesizing to create something new. Um, the, the photo there, for instance, is of the empty uh, man-made lake down on the foreshore that over the past couple of years has been kind of um, built by skaters into a skate park. For a while there, it was kind of flying under the radar, <coughs> pardon me, so, and with people, you know, skaters were enjoying it and kind of, you know, doing their thing. So essentially in terms of bricolage, what they've done there is tinkered, reinvented a public space for their own ends, for their own forms of creativity, for their own enjoyment. Um, but very quickly it becomes more popular, you know, people have more and more stuff in there, it starts to kind of look a bit ugly and re all of a sudden, you know, cops turning up, the council's interested and I think at the moment most of it's been cleared away. What's interesting about this example, I think, is that there's a bunch of, you know, council or, or government built state parks around the place and they're used, um, you know, quite a lot. But there's a kind of element here of resisting that kind of being told to do what you do, what you want, what you love or what you want to do in a particular spot. Because, of course, that means those particular spots are under the microscope and disciplinary techniques of powerful forces all the time. You know, if there's two spots you're allowed to go and skate, where do you think the cops are going to be looking to bust young people all the time? 
So again, this is a kind of good example, I think, of making do. It's kind of the pool, that, that, that pool down there that's been reused has been a good example in Newcastle recently of how there's been resistance to some of the kind of developments um, in public space. So it's in these acts that young people kind of get by, they make do, they challenge norms and restrictions and authority. But this is also how social change and politics kind of works in many ways. People test the boundaries and different ideas kind of emerge, percolate, spread and grow. A really good example of this kind of form of bricolage and a kind of youth culture, a little bit historicised now, is culture jamming. And this is the kind of almost, you know, um, uh, it's, it's kind of almost traditional now that the way that people will um, tinker with billboards and ads and stuff like that. And most of this is kind of also almost part of popular culture now. But this emerged out of the late 90s, particularly around the anti-globalisation movements, well, the so-called anti-globalisation movements. Um, and uh, whose, you know, Bible is kind of the book No, no Logo by Naomi Klein. Culture jamming, some kind, sometimes called ad busting after the magazine that charted it at the time, that still exists as a kind of um, leftist critique of, cult, of consumer culture, um, tinkers with those kind of ad images and tries to reveal the underlining meaning of them. So the one in the corner there and on the next one as well, um, kind of parodies the classic... Calvin Klein obsession uh, perfumes. So what's the obsession for men? He's looking down at his pants. What's the results obsession for women? You know, maybe in terms of keeping up with unrealistic body images, something like bulimia. So you can see a kind of direct political message here, tinkering with everyday taken for granted things, billboards and ads, and, you know, uh, remixing them, reusing them to kind of do something particularly political, resistive, subversive. Klein talks, wrote, writes about um, culture jamming, that it's not just about making a particular pop song or sneaker or ad look absurd. And sneakers were a real thing here, particularly around Nike and Air Jordans that were kind of massive parts of pop culture at the time. Um, you know, but, you know, anti-globalisation movements started to point out how these were made in sweatshops under horrible conditions and, you know, the likes of someone like Michael Jordan seemed to be getting paid as much to do the ads and to wear them as the whole, you know, production process of getting these, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of sneakers being made. So Klein argues that the kind of um, object or motivation is not just to kind of, you know, make uh, those things look absurd, but like it homes in on the flip side of those branded emotions, because brands particularly want to kind of sell us a lifestyle and make us feel things and refocuses them. So they aren't replaced with a craving for the next fashion or pop sensation return slowly on a process of branding itself. So Klein and the, you know, culture jamming practitioners want us to think about, you know, how much do we want to define ourselves as consumers and how much do we want to um, be able to kind of put our lifestyle, put our wants and needs and desires into practice as citizens through politics. There's a kind of playoff here that, that was going on at the time and still is, I would argue, about how we can do that how we can kind of put our self-identity into practice. Of course, there's limits to this kind of politics. You can't boycott everything. And, you know, as soon as kind of Nike sales went down, Reebok went up or whatever, and the sweatshop practices maintain, as soon as there was kind of shell lost business because of their terrible practices after they, there was an execution of a prominent activist um, in Nigeria, you know, Shell kind of fled Nigeria, but Chevron moved in. Um, hired the same mercenaries to, you know, gun down various local protesters as well. So you can only do so much with protesting against brands here. And as, again, client states, I'll, I'll read this out. It is sadly ironic that Chevron has undoubtedly benefited from the fact that activists had made a rather strategic decision to focus their criticism on Shell rather than on the Nigerian oil industry as a whole. It points to one of the significant, at times, manning limitations of brand-based politics. So you can see here, I think... I think, in this example, a bunch of interesting tensions and possibilities that social change certainly happened in some respects out of these act activities, but really, you know, the industries didn't really change overall. Um, boycotts can't seem to make everything change. You can see how this has kind of now developed more with online stuff to the point where, you know, the government recently seriously thought about trying to ban people encouraging boycotts of brands um, you know, if they were supporting, you know, sexist or racist behaviour and things like that. Quite incredible um, attack on our, you know, freedoms, I, I suppose, 
when you when you think about what's what the, that, that implies. Okay, I'm going to leave it there and come back and talk about graffiti. <laughs>